found this man laying with his head roughly the center of the bed, his body coming back like this. His two hands were laying over the, the bed like this, and just off or right below his uh, right hand was a 45 automatic. Just a short way away from his left hand was a shotgun. I didn't know if he was, uh, how bad he was injured, so I picked up, or I grabbed him by the left wrist, and I pulled him out into, or onto the door, which had been used as a barricade. I then backed off again. I'm the deputy chairman of the state of Illinois Black Panther Party, Fred Hampton. I have the pleasure now to introduce who I believe is one of the baddest motherfuckers in the world. A man that did something that a lot of us ought to be very glad that he did. He was a part of making the only party which exists in the United States today that represents the people. As a matter of fact, he was one half. Him and Huey P. Newton started out in 1966. Sometimes I think where some of us were in 1966. I think what we would have said if we'd heard about some niggas going out in the street talking about chance of guns, fighting all them policemen because we didn't know they were pigs out there in the streets. And I think I'm speaking for the whole party of the state of Illinois. I know I am. When I say that we love Huey P. Newton. We love Elvis Cleaver. We love Bobby Hutton. We love the Black Panther Party. And we love Chairman Bobby Seale. We love them because they were the first ones that took a stand against capitalism and racism and said that we'll fight until the end. We said we're drawing the line somewhere, motherfucker. If you try to pass us, we'll blow your brains out. <laughs> they were the first ones that came through with the program that was initiated for the, uh, for the benefit of the people. All those things that I named, the reasons why we love them are reasons that make it beneficial to us. But let me simply say when I'm introducing Brother Bobby that we love him because it's lovely to love. Tell me about the Your guns out on him, blow him away, and then you have the ability and 
that you have made that pig act in a desired manner. But for what? But for what? For a new system, brothers. We need a new system. The people need a new system. I sat yesterday afternoon next to Bobby Seale while he said that a federal marshal tried to ram a four-inch piece of cloth gauze into his mouth. Three marshals held his head. One marshal held his nose so that he couldn't breathe. And the fifth marshal attempted to press against his mouth with all his weight this gauze that ultimately resulted in Bobby bleeding profusely around the mouth and the lips as they tried to jam this piece of object into his mouth to silence him. I'm so thirsty for revolution. I'm so crazy about the people. We're going to stand together. We're going to have a black army, a Mexican-American army. An alliance and solidarity requires the progressive whites, all of us. And we're going to march on this pig pound structure, and we're going to say, stick them up, motherfucker. We come for what's ours. Up against the wall. Power to the people. Thanks, brother. We're going to have to do more than talk. We're going to have to do more than listen. 
We're going to even have to do more than learn. We're going to have to start practicing, and that's very hard. We got to start getting out there with the people. And a lot of times we think we're better than the people. That's an insult, and that's criminal. It's going to take a lot of hard work. Come on in, little brother. Come on in, little sister. Y'all can sit down and get something to eat. Sisters and brothers. Y'all kick off y'all's coat. We need some more stuff out here. your teeth strong. Who else did, who left this milk over here? Huh? That's what the Breakfast Children program is. A lot of people think it's charity, but what does it do? It takes the people from a stage to another stage to another stage, and any program that's revolutionary is an advanced program. Revolution can change, unending, they just keep on changing. That's what we do. We take the people in there and take them through those changes, and before you know it, they are, in fact, not only knowing what socialism is, they don't even have to know what it is. They're endorsing, and they're participating, and they're observing, and they're supporting socialism. Oh, you finna go to school now? All right. Right on. I'll power to the people. That's the people's thing. Socialism is the people. You're afraid of yourself. If you're afraid of socialism, you're afraid of yourself. You know, basically knowing my ideas, and basically you know, me knowing yours, you can uh, support some of our programs. Is that what you're saying? Why not? And you believe in programs like the Breakfast Children Program and Free Health Clinics? Right on, brother? We believe they're good things. Uh huh. As a focal point to organize their mothers and fathers. Uh huh. Peace. Mm -hmm. There's no educational program here? Uh. That's come out of social action. And, you know, you set that up, but I mean, we can't put everything on one piece of paper. What about this bank? Credit union? Mm -hmm. Credit union. Credit union, my brother. Is a if bank. You're hip to, are you hip to credit unions? It is a bank. Yeah, you go and buy money? Yeah. yeah, it's a bank. It's a bank. Owned by the people. Run for the people. And by the people. What would money be given out to people for? Well, the people would decide that. You want to buy, you know, whatever, you know, the people in the community decide. You need some living room furniture, maybe? You need a car, maybe? See, I got, the thing is with me, you dig, I, I need to know some more about it. I wish you had some more literature about the educational thing here. Because, you dig, as far as we're concerned in, uh, in the struggle, the way we look at struggle is that uh, this depends on the educational thing, you dig. Because of this depends on the education. Well, the whole thing. No, but in the end, this does. You, you can form this with no education. You can uh, form this. this. No, not the way we're talking about forming it. You know, right. We're talking about forming it right. You know, it's not on the paper. We didn't write it on no, the paper. No, form it right with no education. No. Let me give you an example. Uh, you, you, your Mo Kenyatta formed the excellent revolution with no education. And on the day to the end thing, your Mo told the motherfucker, I said, well, uh, you know, uh, you've been educated to uh, uh, hate the enemy, but uh, I'm your brother. I help you lead the revolution. Now I'm more pressure. Another example, Papa Doc in Haiti. Papa Doc in Haiti hated everything white. Man, you couldn't put this white paper in front of Papa Doc's face. Seeing but he moved all the white people out, and he took over them to be yeah, oppressed. He did, cause no education. Oh, and the people that had been educated, they just said that we don't hate the motherfucker uh -huh. white people. We hate the oppressor, whether he be white, black, brown, or yellow. So we got to know your education program to find out what is going to be in the finale. A lot of people work. Your Mo Kenyatta is called not a never a revolutionary, but an ex-revolutionary. So it's Papa Doc. They brought on a successful revolution. That thing in the uh, mom's was a bitch. Bantu freedom fighters, all that kind of action. But what we're saying is, that it's the end. 
But you don't judge Castro now. You can't do it. Nobody in this room could judge whether Castro's gonna be a revolutionary or not. Uh, you know what I mean? We're talking about things, you know what I mean, uh, with uh, China, the People's Republic, and even at the stage they're in now, talking about even going on further into a communistic state. That's what we're talking about. Those are revolutionary. So we got to understand here the educational program that you have to be able to figure out whether it will go on the right lines where the people will end up in a situation where they can be able to really control themselves. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, with no education, the people that take this local foundation and start stealing money because they won't be really educated to why it's the people thing anyway. You understand what I'm saying? With no education, you have neo-colonialism instead of colonialism, like you got in uh, Africa now, like you got in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Haiti. So what we're talking about is there has to be uh, an educational program. That's very important. As a matter of fact, we are so important for us that a person has to go through six weeks of our political education before he can consider himself a member of the party, able to even run down ideology for the party. Why? Because if they don't have an education, then they know where. You dig what I'm saying? They know where because they don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. You, do, you might get people caught up in the emotionless movement. Uh, you understand me? You might be, get them caught up in because they're poor and they want something. And then if they're not educated, they want more. And before you know it, they'll be capitalists. And before you know it, we'll have Negro imperialists. Yeah, you see, brother, uh, the reason we don't do a lot of talking because what you say is foregone conclusion with us. Yeah, well, see, brother, the reason I do do a lot of talking is because I don't, there's no foregone conclusion with me. Who they program geared towards? You got black, you got black Christmas, you got black round all day, you got black April food, ain't geared toward nobody but black businessmen. And I say that anybody that comes into our community and does an any type of situation that does not meet the need of the masses, then I, Chairman President of the Black Panther Party, says that I catch that nigga by his collar neck and beat him to death with a black Panther paper. We not doing it. infant mortality rate, where you have uh, lead poisoning, where you have inadequate medical service. We saw, we saw the basic need for free medical service, and we worked hard and worked over long periods of time in order to make that a reality. Now, up to this day in the black community, you have doctors there who are more concerned with private wealth rather than public health. The concept behind the medical center is that we would take the profits out of the medical profession. Our medical center is a direct result of the basic need in the black community for free medical service. You had this done about three days ago, you see? This is not the burned hand. This is another one. Does it feel painful? No, it's not painful. Like it's infected and everything? No, it's not painful. It's good. It's good, yeah. We got doctors for every day this week. Next week, we got... No, we need one for next Thursday. Come to the clinic tomorrow for an appointment. What about... What are the chances of getting an ambulance now? Uh -huh. uh, if we can buy an ambulance, that's the best chance. I mean, what about... Uh, the idea is all right, but it don't, you know, the idea is all right, but we just have to have money to get ammo. Well, how much, I mean, can't you use ammo? Yes. I'm, I'll tell you, I'm going to bring uh, uh, a couple of pharmacists from the hospital no. where I am. They want to come out and see it, and they're interested in working, you know. We can have patients come through, see a doctor. After they get through, get a test or what, what have you, then they come in and see the people's advocate. That's a... Uh, community person or person in the party who acts like a liaison between the center here itself and the community. He asked them what type of service they thought they got here in the center, you know, any other criticisms of the medical center itself. It's also to deal with problems outside medical problems, you know. People's Advocate has a resource file. In this file we have uh, teachers, uh, uh, sociologists, speech therapists, social workers, you know, this is all part of resource life. Okay, well, look at here. <laughs> look at here. Just sit over here and thought about all that jail time he had behind his motherfucking back and say, I got the rap too. 
I'll definitely mess up 50. He got to say something. This is Bobby Rush, deputy minister of defense for the state of Illinois. Bad motherfucker. You can tell the way that he used to, that the Bobby, Chairman Bobby Steele feels the way about Huey P. Newton. I feel the same way about Bobby Rush. We didn't start the Black Panther Party, but we do know this, that we are some bad motherfuckers. The Black Panther Party don't remain here in the state of Illinois. You know, sometimes we get to talking and I go to court, and then so we're afraid, I come back and rush the friend, we got to keep you on the street. Then the Russia go to court, he'll come back and I say, Rush, we got to keep you on the street. And after we just went back and forth, we decided that we like each other so well, goddammit, we both gonna stay on the motherfucking street. Yeah. Ain't nobody going nowhere. We ain't taking us nowhere. We're gonna stay right here with the people. We're going to have to move, and we got to move fast, we got to move hard, and we're gonna have to move organized to be able to keep Bobby Rush on the street. They got our field secretary, Nathaniel Jr., up against the wall. They got our Minister of Information chalked up against the wall. Every they even got Chairman Fred up against the wall. Everybody against the wall. And they ain't talking about giving folks 20 years. They're talking about giving me 20 years, nigga, for ice cream truck robbery. That's right. $71 worth of ice cream, 710 ice cream bars. I might be big, but I can't eat 710 ice cream bars. But even though they tried to give me all that bad publicity, they still came out in the end showing the true nature of a pamphlet. Because they said I went into the truck, beat up this pig that was in our community exploiting the people, took the ice cream bars from him, handed them out to the kids. Even though they made me a thief, they made me a Robin Hood type thief. No. Yay to the people. Here's a man that represents the people. Deputy Minister of Defense for the State of Illinois. Bad motherfucker. A brother of mine, a brother I've been working with a long time to go continue to work with. I'm going to eat with him, I'm going to sleep with him, I'm going to die with him. I'm going to live with him, I'm going to leave with him. By the way. We're going to take the case to the people, and the people say that Fred is going to remain free, that Fred is innocent of anything against the people. He might be uh, guilty of uh, fucking over the power structure, but we can relate to that. All yeah. power to the people, and uh, we're going to move on this power structure, and like Bobby said, we're going to say, get up against the wall, motherfucker, because it's a hold up, and we came to get what's ours. Thank you. Yeah. Now, we're going to organize a movement so big to make sure that the leaders of the Black Panther Party in this state are not political prisoners and are not exiled and not killed, that that movement is going to be so big that we might even have to go and get Huey P. Newton and let him carry a sign. We're going to have everybody involved. We're going to have everybody involved. And we're going to start a thing called Free Fred. Don't that sound nice? Hey, let's do that. Free Fred. I'd like for you again to describe to me what happened, if anything, after you and Officer Duff had pulled onto the school ground. Uh, well, I identified you as the person who uh, grabbed me by the throat and held me down in the ice cream stand. Well, we were walking looking through the crowd, and looking for the one who would beat him up. And what, if anything, did he say when he saw me? Or what, if anything, did you say to him? Who said something first? He said, that's him. I'll never forget his face. That's the one. Okay, now when that police car pulled up, what, if anything, happened? 
Well, a policeman, one policeman was on the outside of the car, and this one was on the inside of the car. Officer Dunn pointed to Fred and said, that's the man that did it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the ice cream man um, said, yes, I think so. So in other words, the officer pointed out, and he is being the, the, the person who had robbed this man, and in response to that, after that, the uh, ice cream uh, truck driver said, I guess that's the man. That's right. What race were these police? One was white and one was colored. Right on. <laughs> Officer Dunn, do you know the, do you know the defendant, Fred Hampson? <coughs> yes, I know Fred Hampson. Do you know uh, uh, basically what Fred Hampson stands for? Politically. No, I don't. Uh, Officer Dunn, do you know do you know the the, the situation that poor people, black people, and white poor people, and red people, and brown people are in in this country today? Well, not completely. But you do know, uh, that part that you do know, does, does that, is that part include the fact that uh, these people are being uh, oppressed by some white people that uh, like to oppress people to make profit? Do you know that? Objection. Sustain. <laughs> let, let me rephrase the question. Do you know that a whole lot of uh, blood sucking pigs are not Objection. Hey, please, uh, yeah. do you Do you know? Uh, do you think you're free, Officer Dunn? Yes, I think I'm free. No more questions, Officer Dunn. God help you. So we say, we always say to Black Panther Party that they can do anything they want to to us. We might not be back. I might be in jail. I might be anywhere. But when I leave, you can remember I said with the last words on my lips that I am a revolutionary. And you're going to have to keep on saying that. You're going to have to say that I am a proletarian. I am the people. I'm not the pig. You've got to make a distinction. And the people are going to have to attack the pig. The people are going to have to stand up against the pig. That's what the pastors are doing. That's what the pastors are doing all over the world. We have brought to trial here Fred Hampton. You are here to judge between two conflicting testimonies. Somebody is lying. Now, reason stands. I, I reason is very clear here that Private Jones, who had come from Sanford, North Carolina, would have no great desire to see Fred Hampton up in this trial. But Fred Hampton, a key figure in this community, has great reason for not wanting to be put at, uh, in jail. But the state's attorney and the state's attorney's office has reason to see Fred Hampton in jail. We've got a new state's attorney, you see. And he said already what he thought about people that had different uh, political beliefs than he had. His speeches sound somewhat like those of Hitler. And we know why he wants to see Fred Hampton put in jail. Why do I have a lot of arrests? Because of harassment. Why is that harassment? Because the people that harassed me have set up a problem that made me disagree with them violently. And, and they, they set up this problem in order to exploit me and other people like me. And why they want to get rid of me because I'm saying something that might wake up some other exploited people and some other oppressed people. And if all these people ever get together, then these pigs that are exploiting us, we'll be able to run them into the lake. That's why they want to get rid of us. And it's just, uh, it's sort of like a primary thing with me. I'm the, I'm the first move that they'll make. I'm a part of an organization who'll be the first organization they'll move on because I happen to be a part of an organization, the Black Panther Party, that is the only organization, in fact, that has came out and stood up loud and clear and said that we don't care what anybody says, whether they have guns or not and badges or 18 uniforms, if whenever they step outside the bounds of legality into the bounds of illegality, then we'll blow their brains out if they're bothering the people. Right and what makes them mad about that? They're constantly bothering the people. Anybody that's out there for the protection of the people happens to be in direct conflict with them. What makes them mad about it? What makes them mad about it is that they have 
black people and white poor people and red poor people and Puerto Rican poor people and Latin American Puerto Rican people of uh, all poor people of all descent, they had them caught up in movements based on racism when the Black Panther Party stood up and said that we don't care what anybody says. We don't think you fight fire with fire best, we think you fight fire with water best. We're gonna fight racism, not with racism, but we're gonna fight with solidarity. We said we're not gonna fight capitalism with black capitalism, but we're going to fight it with socialism. We stood up and said we're not going to fight reactionary pigs and reactionary state attorneys like this and reactionary state attorneys like Hanrahan with any other reactions on our part. We're going to fight their reactions with all of us people to get together and have an international proletarian revolution. Right on. Right on. Right on. Right on. And that's saying all power to the people. Right on. Right on. That's saying that no matter what color you are, there's only two classes. And that's saying that there's a class over here and there's a class over there. And the reason that this class over here has never did anything to get this class off his back because this is lower, this is upper, this is the oppressed, this is the oppressor, this is the exploited, this is the exploiter. And these people in this class have divided themselves. They say, I'm black and I hate white people. I'm white and I hate black people. I'm Latin American and I hate hillbillies. I'm hillbillies and I hate Indians. So we fight amongst each other. And you, you've heard the testimony of pigs here. And you got pigs of all colors, you know that. You got pigs that are white, you got pigs that are black, you even got pigs that are black and white. Propagating the same type of madness that uh, uh, this buffoon Henry had would be propagating if he were here himself. And why? Because they want to keep you to believing that I'm your enemy and that everybody else that's black and that wears a lot of hair on his head and hair on his face, they want to keep you thinking that he's your enemy. Why? Because if ever you would disregard him and overlook him just for a minute and throw away that question of racism and start to dealing with a little logic, then it could be, there would be no one else you could attack other than Hanrahan, other than Daly, and other than Tricky Dicky Nixon. And if you make the right decision, then the press people of the world will get complete satisfaction. I know you return to the verdict of not guilty. Thank you. Today is May 1st. U.E.P. Newton, trial is up for appeal today. Our chairman, Fred Hampton, has not arrived yet. The pigs are trying to incarcerate him. These are some of the things we have to deal with. Somebody somewhere knows what happened to Fred this afternoon. So, oh. pig, you motherfucking pigs, get off your dead asses, FBI, and J. Who Edgar. Right and up. Pig, and find Fred before 7 o'clock. Right hey. Hey, wait, 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 You find Fred, motherfucker. Right on. Right on. And if anybody's out there with him, that's harming him, or that's, that, that's kidnapping him, and he happens to be a pig, well, then we just don't discriminate by who we, whose ass we gonna kill. We run out! So y'all go home now and uh, grease them pieces. Right on. Set them sights and whatnot. Raise them windows. And if we can't find Fred, we're gonna give y'all a call. I know somebody's gonna screw this to me that, uh, we advocate people to go out and ride. You know? <laughs> I told y'all before, you know, the riding just ain't no hip thing. Right on. Right on. Right on. So we want everybody, when you leave here, we got to leave here at 2 o'clock, I think. Hey, hey, pig back there, do we have to leave here at 2? Ask him again. Hey, pig in the back. Hey, pig. Yeah, go we got pig. 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 Panther headquarters. A police raid is expected. We're praying that Henry Hand leads the charge. I don't know. We're praying he leads the charge. I said that the pig was chicken out tonight. I said it. I do. We go out there and 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 we go out there
Yeah, they be here. We don't know what time they be here, but if you think they'll be here. Yeah, you probably gonna check if you like to have them. What's your name? All I know is we got there. Okay, got, just okay, got it. Okay. Well, that's all right, I got it. What type of blood do you have? Be positive. Make sure you don't get me no pig blood. Huh? Red now. Red, right? All those folks at that window, when if, if, uh, uh, Adam Bob, I mean, tear gas and stuff, uh, song, here's your water and your, uh, mask. Keep this on you. Okay. You know, I know a lot of people, you know, that hear things like this and see things like this, couldn't understand the motive behind it. Some of us young people, and you know what I mean, I know a lot of people couldn't understand it. I see, uh, me, myself, you know, I was born in a so-called uh, bourgeois community and had some of the better things you could see in life. And I found that even some of the better things of life for black people were too cool. And I found that it was more people starving than it was people eating. And I found that more people uh, didn't have clothes than they did have clothes. And I found that I just happened to be one of the few. And I made a commitment to myself that I wouldn't stop doing what I'm doing until all those people are free. A lot of times I wanted for it to be possible for people to be free under capitalism. I wanted to, for uh, socialism to be able to be brought about through means other than violent means. But right. those were times when I was trying to be subjective. I was looking at things and trying to make them the way I wanted to make them be. Because I didn't mind dying, but I just thought, well, everybody shouldn't have to die. And what we're saying is that we, we're more than people that are for armed struggle. We're people that are for armed struggle for the purpose of bringing on the people's revolution, for the purpose of setting up initially the socialistic state, and for the purpose, secondarily, of advancing into what you would call utopia or what we would call a communist state. We are saying that by observation and participation, by educating and by arming and by teaching the people polit revolutionary political power, we think that we as the vanguard can move those people that need to be moved that way. We can let those people ride our backs as oxen down the path of social revolution. And on and on and on, and finally, like we said, utopianism, what you call communism. We, we're very confident that nobody's coming in the front door. Nobody, no gas. Nobody getting on the roof, Jim. I want you to know that. Nobody getting on the roof. We believe in, uh, what is it, fire, cover, and fire. The minister of health, the minister of health and doctor is going to be covering me after I, I, while I'm loading up. Now, to see you in, a, in all the given situations, like when you're trying to frighten anybody, see, because uh, uh, when you got pipes on him and you got power, power too, you want the back. What do you say? What do you say about this building? Building? Right over here on uh, West, around the corner of West. You know, it's, about 10, it's 10, 12 stories. It's higher than this. Yeah. Now, see, the only way we can, we can get him is I'll shoot him, I'll give him more firepower. See, we can keep him pinned down. He can't get up and shoot if there's too many bullets coming at us. So the only way that we can uh, get him is I'll shoot him, uh, put too much firepower on him where he can't uh, jump. Well, okay. Therefore, what you're saying is uh, we got to eliminate, uh, just throw that process out of our, out of our mind by firing from the field of like that. No, no, no. You just said, you just, that, and a whole lot of uh, semi-automatic and automatic action on him over there, and he, he, he ain't got no time to sight nobody. That's right. Just keep uh, it uh, down. Yeah. Well, no, uh, you might think uh, sound reaction there on my pride, man, but I just wish they would come tonight. Yeah, well, I want them to come. come. I wish they would. I said the people. I said the people. I don't know, why, don't you, why don't you get a military uh, viewpoint of how much chance they got coming up here? here no, no, it's impossible. That's right. What is it ever said? The difference between 20 million That's niggas right, and 20 man. million niggas on the hill. This is impossible, man. I ain't bullshit. I ain't know. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize it, man. Tell me what it's up. Yeah, Jack, but uh, See, we put, we put Rush out there and you, and he won't even be able to get up. Two ain't. Hey, we aren't asking for no water. No, but I, I go, know, I, the, uh, the way I see it, yeah. It's, it's yeah, but the way I see it, the pigs try to take this here off. I think the people would have their first people's victory. <laughs> 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 Wait a minute, who was that? Wait a minute, you... We are drawing the line right here. Pigs will come no further. They are not going to make us retreat. We are going to have somewhere, no matter how far we run, no matter how long we have to run, that we 
when we reach that point, we're going to be able to stop and say in the voice and hear you say it is that, uh, motherfucker, you what you for, you did? Because, uh, I got my gun, motherfucker, and you got yours. And if you try to shoot me with your gun, motherfucker, or if you try to take my gun, well, then, uh, 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 I, I, I intend to blow your motherfucking brains out. <laughs> We have, Your Honor. What is your verdict? We, the jury, find the defendant, Fred Hampton, not guilty. Oh! 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 Chapter, like Panther Party, 2350 West Madison, Chicago, Illinois. Press release, May 27th, 1969. Pig power structure and their lackeys and another attempt of pig repression have sentenced Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton to two to five years in prison. While Chairman Fred is in prison, the police attack Panther headquarters. There are three Panthers in the office, five policemen are shot, the three Panthers are beaten when they run out of ammunition. The Was there a fire in the, uh, they set a fire after they got two pigs set a fire, uh, they, uh, they did it. After they got the brothers down, they went back up there and the fire started. Nobody, nobody was up there except the, the police when the right fire right started. Right right right. Frank, you want to come? Get a picture there, dude. Yeah. Check that door, man. Magnified shotgun.
Jamie Fred is gone, gone from the streets where his heart and his people are, but not for long. For the people's love for Fred Hampton is lovelier than lovely. on the office, the community were all out there. They were in the uproar. They couldn't dig it, because they know we are the people's party. We are working in the interest of the people. You dig it? Right. I'd like to talk about what we're doing, because we're in the Black Panther Party. Yeah, we are. We are our propaganda unit. But we spend most of our time working with these programs and helping the people, serving the people. Huey P. Newton, our Minister of Defense, says that the Black Panther Party uh, it's an organization like Oxen to be ridden by the people down the path of social revolution. You dig it? That's what we're talking about. They advanced on our office because of these programs. And we putting these programs out for the people. Dig it? That's what they're for. The programs are the answer the basic needs and desires of the people, to let the people know that the Black Panther Party is concerned about the basic needs and desires of the people. They educate the people to the fundamentals of socialism and the heightened contradiction. That's what it's all about. And they're going to attack us because we ain't talking about the Black Panther Party that's going to overthrow the government. We, uh, we saying we're going to heighten the contradiction so the people can see that injustices that go on and the people can decide whether the government needs change or not. Process, a learning process. Sometimes I started thinking about some of the actions that's going to be taken against me and other members of the party, and I said, I don't know why I'm not scared. But you know what I define as being? I define as being a people high. I define as being high off the people. You high? I'm high. You understand what I'm saying? I'm high off the people. I'm sitting near way to the penitentiary, and I went to the penitentiary way down in the Nile the North. I'm thinking, I said, well, I'm way down here in the country. I might can't hear no people when I got to Menard. I myself, even being in the vanguard, had to get on my knees and learn from the people. I had to put my ear to the ground. And when I put my ear to the ground, I heard a beat. <laughs> by anybody. We're talking about we're going to make some changes in this system. We know they have our pictures, we know they're looking for us, we know they want us, but we're still saying that even though we couldn't be in a fit, as far as this system goes, on the mountaintop, we in the Black Panther Party because of our dedication and understanding what's in the valley, knowing that the people in the valley, knowing that we originally came from the valley, knowing that our flag is the same flag as the people in the valley, knowing that our enemy is on the mountaintop, our friends are in the valley. We say even though it's nice to be on the mountaintop, we're going back to the valley. <laughs> I 
officers every day. I be in the streets propagandizing every day. I be working with everybody every day. I be teaching that solidarity is the thing. The end of a complete wipeout of imperialism is the thing. So if you're going to be thinking about me, that's what Bobby would be teaching. If you're going to be thinking about us, all we say is we don't, ain't no thing about going nowhere, getting killed. All we want to know is that you're doing what we'd be doing if we were here. And you've got to do that. You can't do it unless you believe that you can do it. In the spirit of liberation, we understand that they want everybody in the party in jail. And we know that if we try to figure out and separate and divide who should go and who shouldn't go, we spend more time doing that than working for the people. So the quick solution. Put your hands down now. We say all power to all people. We say white power to white people. Brown power to brown people. Yellow power to yellow people. Black power to black people. X power to those that we left out. We say Panther power to the Vanguard Party. When you leave here, you know what I'm saying? The last words, before you go to bed at night, say, I am a revolutionary. Make that the last word. In case you don't wake up, then somebody might believe it and you might, you know, end up in uh, what they call it, revolutionary happy hunting ground. <laughs> say that. But I am a revolutionary. That's where the tomorrow, that all our sorrow will be turned into action. He said, but you have to remember one thing, and that's be strong. He wasn't afraid of anything. The immediate violent criminal reaction of the occupants in shooting at announced police officers emphasizes the extreme viciousness of the Black Panther Party. So does their refusal to cease firing at the police officers when urged to do so several times. This is 2337 West Monroe, described by police as a depot for Black Panther Party arms and ammunition. 
Fourteen state's attorney's policemen, led by Sergeant Daniel Grove, found out indeed it was a depot for weapons. After a 15-minute gun battle that cost Illinois Black Panther Party Chairman Fred Hampton his life, Sergeant Groth described the parade as 50 minutes of hell and a miracle. A miracle because not one policeman was killed, a miracle because not more policemen were shot. The firing stopped only when the occupants realized their arsenal was no match for the police arsenal, an arsenal that included a 45 caliber submachine gun and two shotguns. What they didn't understand, and what Edward B. Henrahan doesn't understand, and what Richard Jolovec, his chief assistant, didn't understand, and what those police officers who put those two bullets in the skull of his head as he lay asleep didn't understand, and what Richard Nixon and his assistant lackey, Mr. Mitchell, don't understand, is that you can't kill Chairman Fred. Right on! What they didn't understand is that anyone who would try to kill him is and shall ever be an enemy of the people. And that whoever would do that can only be appropriately called not a person, but a pig. Right what they didn't understand, what they didn't understand when they did that is that pigs die, but Chairman Fred lives. You are the ones who are gonna, gonna decide for yourselves what happened in that apartment on the morning of December 4th. You're gonna decide whether or not Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were the victims of premeditated murder. At this time, there's no response from over there. I take my revolver in my right hand and I found possibly four, five, or six times. A voice from within, a male voice from within, replies, who's there? I respond, police officers, I have a search warrant, open the door. As soon as Sergeant Daniel Groth and Officer James Davis, who are leading our men, announced their office, Occupants of the apartment attacked them with shotgun fire. I wait several seconds. There's no reply from within. The door's not open. I again take my revolver in my right hand. I wait a second or so. A male voice from within the apartment says, Just a minute. There was no response from the group. The response from the group was the firing of a shotgun blast at our police officers. No verbal response in addition to the, the, the response to our police officers was the firing at them by a person in the apartment. Didn't they ask who was it several times? When the police officers uh, announced their office, they were fired upon. Didn't they ask who was it at the door? I looked at Duke. It's okay, Duke. Going over, going over to about here. And I hit the door, and I go to the bed. Duke forces this door here open. Simon says so with that, we enter. A shot rings out. Duke falls off in this direction. I enter in a semi-erect position. There's a woman lying on the bed with a shotgun, calmly pumping it, pointing in my direction, and fires. The, the uh, fire illuminates her face, I get a very good look at her. I feel something go over my left shoulder. I then step back here, I look in, get up on my toes, find my revolver, look in again, cover my face, and fire several shots at the girl. I heard a knock on the door. They said, police told us to open up. And my clock, he said, just a minute, he got up. And next thing I knew, they had busted into the door. They came in shooting, they shot uh, me, they shot Mark Clark. This woman fires a shot. And she, the illumination apparently illuminates, or Dan's shooting illuminates a fella sitting behind the door in a chair. He's pumping his shotgun. I turn in his direction, I fire two shots at him. As he, as the shots apparently hit him, he stands up, I stand up with him, 
We struggle. He falls down over the chair on the floor with his head facing the corner of the door here in the wall. I fall across his body. This here is the room where the first brother, Mark Clark, was murdered at. Don't touch nothing, don't move nothing, because we want to keep everything just the way it is. Don't, don't touch no walls. Please don't. OK, this here is the door that they said the uh, sister fired through with a shotgun. But if the sister had fired through this door with a shotgun, you can look at the wall out there and see some uh, uh, holes where the pellets had left out there. You can see no signs of a shotgun blast being fired through this door here. Sir, you say your men were fired upon. Witnesses who have seen the apartment say there is no evidence of bullets from the direction where the uh, Panthers supposedly were to be. I said that uh, after our officers uh, announced their uh, purpose and their station several times, uh, they were fired upon from within the room. We say this is no nothing more than a fascist lie uh, to justify the murder that took place in this crib here. This doorway here, which is absent of a door, the door has been removed and is now in the possession of our defense attorney, and it's going to be used in our case to prove that what happened here was nothing more than murder. After days of maneuvering, Black Panther attorney Francis Andrew finally brought a bullet-punctured door panel to the inquest. However, a controversy immediately arose as to whether Andrew's panel was the same one that was removed from the Black Panther apartment. This is Andrew's version. Which, which side is the uh, outside, sir? The outside, uh, you're looking inside. from the inside now. Looking from the inside now? Yes. You look out this side. Is the inside? This is the outside. Uh, it looks like the, the door is splintered on both sides. You see that there is a hole up here, which no, none of the police in their testimony have mentioned. As a matter of fact, they have denied this hole up here. It shows a, a bullet coming from the outside to the inside. The hole at the bottom there. The hole at the bottom is a hole that was made while the door was standing wide open. Assistant State's Attorney Nicholas Motherway says Andrew could have gotten the door panel at any lumber yard. Motherway's point was backed up at least in part by a police crime lab technician who examined the door in the Panther apartment the same day as the raid. The technician said first of all that there was only one hole in the panel the day he examined it, and second of all, he said that he couldn't be sure the panels were one in the same. This is December 4th, 1969 at 10.54 a.m. My name is Skip Andrew and I'm at 2337 West Monroe Street, Chicago, Illinois. This door, which is the door entering into the living room, has two holes in it. This one I'm pointing to right here, 10 inches from the edge, and this one uh, down here, uh, 12 inches. Uh, the first one I referred to being 25 from the top, and the uh, second one, 36 from the top. Now, as you open this, there's also, of course, a knob door in this one. As you open this door, there's uh, blood uh, behind the door. The, uh, top, the top hole shows that the bullet was incoming. They fired through the door and hit the brother through the door. The brother fell here. Most of the blood is dried up, but you can see a little bit of it there and a little bit of it on the floor. The brother was shot four or five times, so after they came through the door, they shot him again to make sure he was dead. Mr. Montgomery, uh, Dr. Constantino testified today that Mark Clark could not have struggled after receiving that shot through the heart. Now, in your mind, does this contradict the testimony of Officer Davis, who described a struggle? Uh, yes, it seems to me that that was a very startling thing. We also learned that uh, the bullet, which was in fact recovered from Mr. Hampton's body, uh, was a bullet fired uh, out of a carbine by Officer Davis. So that indicates also that Officer Davis uh, may well have walked into that back bedroom, contrary to his testimony, and fired a shot into the body of Fred Hampton at one point in time or other. There were six of us assigned to the back door. I came up on the back porch. I placed myself to the right of the door. I put my head down enough so I could hear if there was any conversation in the building. I heard people talking in the front, and then I heard a loud uh, shot, sounded like a shotgun. I backed up and kicked the door open. I started in, and before I could get past the threshold, there were three shots fired from the rear bedroom. They were directed directly at the back door 
uh, as I was coming in. I backed out again. Only by the grace of God uh, were one of our or two of our police officers prevented from being killed uh, when they were fired upon as soon as they announced their office and knocking on the door. On December 11, 1969, the Chicago Tribune carried a story that it characterized as an exclusive version from the state's attorney's office. Why was the uh, disclosure made in the Chicago Tribune? Because the, that newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, in my opinion, gave a very balanced, fair report of the events that occurred. It has nothing to do with the class of people or the type of people that buy the Tribune as opposed to other papers in the city? Does anybody have a sensible question? Included in the exclusive was a photo carefully circled to show bullet holes supposed to be in the back door. The account that we made public yesterday gives a detailed explanation of what happened in that apartment. Uh, I stand wholeheartedly behind it as absolutely accurate. There is one inconsistency in, well, for example... Uh, I do not intend to quibble about that account. Do you intend nor to get at the truth? The account that we gave of the events is the truth. One of the four pictures you gave the Tribune had two bullet holes on the right side of what was supposed to be the rear door. Uh, Henry, has been, Henry has has lied before and he's going to lie again. That, that hole that he's blown up in the papers is a, a, is a hole of a nail. Tight close-up of a nail head. Plus a little bit of the door hasp. Plus the door hasp. Mm -hmm. Now, you, here you see the large nail heads being pointed out. I have said that uh, we released the pictures. We have not characterized or described uh, the uh, conditions that they portray, other than to say that that is an accurate portrayal of that uh, particular object. Do you know if any of the four pictures they received had portrayed bullet holes in any of the walls? I, I... Another photo claimed to show the bullet-riddled door across from the bedroom. The officers testified that the Panthers fired into that door from inside their bedroom. In fact, the door in the photo was the bedroom door, and the holes in the door were made by police gunfire at the Panthers. As you can see, the bathroom door is intact. Not only the bathroom door, but the entire wall area is intact. There was a, there was a picture of the um, inside of the door to the bathroom, yes. That door, our reporters discovered, corresponded to one on the front living room adjoining the bedroom. <clears throat> there were holes in the door. When the door was open, they, those holes corresponded to holes that were in the wall adjoining between the bedroom and the living room. And when they stuck a stick through the holes, they all matched up. I have, I make, as I say again, I make no evaluation of the pictures other than to say they, they portray conditions as they existed in that apartment at the time those pictures were taken. This is the door that's supposed to contain numerous marks from a stray shotgun blast and small arm fire, which again was fired by members of the vicious Black Panther Party who were standing in this bedroom here, shooting out into the hallway here. I urge, I urge your inventory of each of these vicious weapons this attack, this attack by the Black Panthers on the police, plus the rep weapons which were recovered uh, at the uh, depot where they were storing them, clearly demonstrates the true character of the Black Panther Party. Nobody, I have never denied that there were no weapons there. As a matter of fact, he would be a fool if he didn't have a weapon there, knowing uh, the, the ferociousness of the pigs, how they just jump out of the cars and, and shoot you down, how they knock on your door and blow 19-year-old uh, sister's head off with shotguns, how they kill two brothers in, in one week. Uh, yeah, he's, and as a matter of fact, everybody that, that, that's concerned should have a, a something in their homes to protect themselves because Hanrahan is a madman. Mr. Hanrahan, can you tell me why your officers did not try to use tear gas? Isn't this the usual procedure to flush someone out of a building? Our officers uh, use the means necessary to effect the search uh, and to present, prevent themselves from being killed upon after they were killed, after they were fired upon. Isn't it true that you usually use, your men usually use uh, tear gas in situations such as this? And why didn't they use it this time? No, that is not true. It is not true? They came with a uh, murder on their mind, you see? And even if they wanted to take somebody to jail, it would be a simple matter of just shooting some tear gas in here to draw everybody yeah, out. Right. right on. 
This is where our chairman had his brains blown out as he uh, lay in his bed, sleeping at 4.30 in the morning. Someone came into the room, started shaking the chairman. Said, Chairman, Chairman, wake up. The pigs are laughing. Still half asleep. I looked up, and I saw a bullet coming from it looked like the front of the apartment, from the kitchen area. And they were, the pigs were just shooting. And uh, about this time, I jumped on uh, top of the chairman. He looked up. Uh. Looked like all the pigs converged at the entranceway to the bedroom area, the back bedroom area. The mattress is just going. You could feel the bullets going into it. I just knew we'd be dead, everybody in there. Um, when he looked up, he just looked up. He didn't say a word. He didn't move, except for moving his head up. He laid his head back down to the side like that. He never said a word. He never got up out the bed. Uh, the person who was in the room, they kept hollering out, stop shooting, stop shooting. We have a pregnant woman or a pregnant sister in here. At the time, I was eight and a half, nine months pregnant. My baby was to be delivered in two weeks. Pigs kept on shooting. So uh, he kept on hollering out. Finally, they stopped. They pushed the... Uh, me and the other brother by the uh, kitchen door and told us to face the wall. Heard a pig say, he's barely alive, he'll barely make it. I assume they were talking about Chairman Fred. So then they started shooting the pigs, they started shooting, up, shooting again. I heard the sister scream. They stopped shooting. The pig said, He's good and dead now. The pigs were running around laughing. They were really happy, you know. Talking about Chairman Fred is dead. I never saw Chairman Fred again. Inflammatory statements and false charges against our office have been made by spokesmen for the Black Panther Party and others, despite the fact that the speakers had no reliable knowledge about the occurrence. Well, the best account that I can give is uh, the, uh, the room that I was in and the, the, the actions of things surrounding me personally, you know. First thing I remember when I woke up was uh, a knock on the door, and it was only a matter of seconds. In fact, I'd say it was less than five seconds that I heard, you know, shots. Now, the thing that struck me was that I not only heard shots, but I can uh, see plaster coming out of the walls, of the, uh, out of the walls in my room. So th I knew the bullets were coming through the room that I was in. I stepped over and I put the machine gun still on single fire, and I started from the left side of the wall, coming across, watching where the rounds were hitting, and I went over the girl's head, down on the other side of her, and continued fire across this wall. One strange thing about this wall is this. The state attorney, the Stoppel rating pig, say that they fired uh, numerous uh, slugs going up and downward, up and downward motion, attempting to avoid hitting the people in the, in the apartment here. You notice that all these slugs are on a straight line. You also notice they all were fired at a low level, at about bed level. Next thing I remember is uh, someone, I think it was one of the pigs, told us to come out of the room. But there were still shots being fired. Now, I didn't know at this here time that people had came, were coming through the back door, but I took it that shots were being fired in the back of the house and at the front of the house. And, uh, you know, they, they were all coming through, through the walls. The walls were nothing but plasterboard. And, you know, a bullet come through the front of the house, it would go all the way through the, out the back. Somebody told us to get out, but I remember we were so afraid and bullets were still coming that we remained on, on the floor. I heard another pause, and then one of the pigs told us that if we don't come out, he was going to put something in there that would really get him out. The idea came in my mind 
The day we're going to shoot tear gas or something in there. We realize that there are still some people remaining in the front bedroom. We don't know whether they're injured or not. So I plead, and I can you, I beg them to come out. Please come out with your hands out. Throw out your weapon. But the next thing I heard was a barrage of shots real fast. And, uh, you know, we were hit this time. I started with the gun, still on single fire, being very careful and watching where each round hit on the wall. I walked them around uh, the girl sitting on the bed and brought it all the way across the wall again. As I was doing this, Officer Davis was stepping up, and he started firing across the wall from right to left. I put one shot into the door. I put a short burst with the machine gun on automatic fire into that closet. I fired four or five shotgun blasts into the bedroom. The second form, still coming up, caught a blast as the gun came further across the room. They told me, uh, you know, to get up and walk. And I told them I couldn't. And then they, I think they hit me or did something. They told me they would kill me if I stayed there. So I kept trying. I managed, you know, to get up. And uh, I made a little hop. And I finally I hopped out, you know. I am taking the word of our policemen uh, over what we understand is supposed to be a version provided by uh, defense attorneys and by the occupants of the apartment. I was hit five times. I was hit um, two times in the stomach, one time in the leg, and I was hit a graze in each hand. Yeah. This is just a scar. You know, I had to have a section of my colon taken out because of an infection. And I was shot over here. I expect the general public to recognize the quality of these men's work and the political consequences can take care of themselves. Of course I don't plan to resign. I just change the story every time uh, from newspaper to newspaper, from channel, one channel to another channel. He's had to change the story as we've brought up facts, truths about the evidence uh, that he reportedly have given out, such as the nail heads, such as the uh, uh, bullet holes and whatnot in the walls. And it, it's only th my conclusion is that Hanrahan, if he wanted to give an objective opinion about what happened here uh, that morning, he would have to come to this apartment and find out because he's dealing in a whole lot of subjective analysis because the man haven't uh, come to the apartment to find out what really did go down in the apartment. And we invite Hanrahan here to see for himself the evidence that uh, uh, we have shown to the masses of people and to the public. Mr. Henry, have you been at the scene yourself? No, I have not been at the scene. Based on available evidence, namely the physical condition of the home and its contents, the physical condition of the remains of Fred Hampton, the search warrant was merely a subterfuge, and the mission of the police was to murder and maim. This blatant act of legitimatized murder strips all credibility from law enforcement. In the context of other acts against militant blacks in recent months, it suggests an official policy of systematic repression. The pious statements of State's Attorney Hanrahan concerning the brave response of the police against the vicious panther attack and his allusion to the grace of God concerning the sparing of the policemen only makes the situation more macabre and terrifying. As an individual, are you convinced that the official version is a lie, that it is a case of murder? Personally, I am. Anyone who went through that apartment and examined the evidence that was remaining there could come to only one conclusion, and that is that Fred Hampton, 21 years old, and a member of a militant, well-known militant group, was murdered in his bed, probably as he lay asleep. It seems very clear to us that he was assassinated. And the police officer who did that assassination then walked away from it, then walked away from it and said to other people, Bobby Rush is next. Now, all of you who know Bobby Rush know that he is the Minister of Defense of the Black Panther Party and also one of our clients. Uh, and all of you also, I assume, know that Bobby Rush's apartment was broken into last night and also searched. 
But fortunately for him, he's still alive because he was not in the apartment. Do you think if you had been in your apartment yesterday, you would have been shot by police? Yes, I would have been murdered. I still think there's a, a great possibility of uh, people trying to murder me. All the moves uh, in the past, the initiative has been on the part of the police. Uh, they've murdered Fred Hampton. Uh, they're out to murder me. It's like they'll murder anybody that's black in this country. Do you think there's going to be retaliation then by the Panthers? There, there won't be any retaliation by the Panthers. I think that the time will come when the people themselves will uh, take the power that belongs to them into their hands and move uh, uh, to guarantee life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We will not be forced underground until the, uh, until the people we really feel satisfied that we've done our duty, uh, formed our duty to uh, educate the masses of the people to the injustices that the power structure inflicts upon poor people in this country. All the uh, mass demonstrations that young people uh, endorse that this is happening right now. Bobby, what's the next move for you personally? Uh, I haven't, my, I'm, there's no personal in, anymore. I'm the people's man, so I do whatever the people decide. There's nothing personal about it whatsoever. And uh, the Panthers uh, will be there to serve the people in the end. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of course, numerous people have attempted to make formal and informal investigations with a report by the grand jury for the Federal District Court in the Northern District of Illinois. Then I quote, this report contains the findings of the grand jury after hearing nearly 100 witnesses and considering over 130 exhibits including police records, photographs, moving pictures, transcripts of testimony before other bodies, voluminous investigative and scientific reports, and reports of investigative interviews with over 100 potential witnesses who were not called. And of course, among the main witnesses before the federal grand jury were the 14 raiders in the apartment, the police officers who were assigned to the state's attorney's office. The report tells us, contrary to some of their testimony prior to the grand jury proceedings, the report tells us that at 4 a.m. on December 4, Sergeant Groth briefed the 13 assembled officers and told them the location of the raid and that Panther arms were involved. Did you know that uh, they were Black Panthers? No, we didn't. We just knew that, or we were informed that there were guns and uh, contraband in the building. Did you have information that indicated that Fred Hampton might be there? Not to my knowledge. You just knew that there were guns and uh, possibility of that these may, may have been Black Panthers? All we knew is there were guns in there. At this point, uh, it appears that uh, the people who uh, are deceased were in the gun battle? Oh, they were definitely in the gun battle. I mean, they were firing at police? Yes, sir. We saw the shots coming out of the two bedrooms. Sergeant Groth, of course, from the beginning, claimed, along with his fellow officers, that a shot had been fired by a young Panther woman in the far corner of the living room door as the officers entered the door. The report, however, explains the impossibility of this account given by the officers. Reading again now from the report from page 181, it says, Groth, Davis, Jones, and Gorman, those are all officers, all insist that a shot was fired by Brenda Harris at them as they came in the door. None of them could explain what had become of this shot and it is not possible to draw a line from the southeast corner of the living room where Harris was said by Davis and Groth to be on the bed holding the gun, out through the living room door, the entrance hall door, and the outside door. There are no holes in the west wall of the apartment. Officer Carmody, when you knocked on the door, what happened? Well, I didn't actually knock. I heard our officers at the front uh, announce their office and shots fired. Uh, so I kicked in the back door, and as soon as the door opened, uh, I could see uh, shots being fired at us at the back door. you have any idea how many shots were fired? Uh, quite a few. I have no idea. you have any idea over how long a period the gun battle ensued? It seemed like an hour to me. Of course, the Raiders would have us believe that they approached the apartment in a gentlemanly fashion, that they were attempting to save human life. They knocked on the door and they announced their purpose. They fired no shots until they were fired at. They called for a ceasefire on at least three different occasions. Thereafter, three times, Sergeant Groth ordered all his men to cease firing and told the occupants to come out with their hands up. Each time, one of the occupants replied, shoot it out. 
and they continued firing at the police officers. By their own testimony, they admit that for 12 minutes, for 12 solid minutes in those early morning hours, there was gun firing in that apartment. And yet the federal grand jury concludes that only one possible shot could have come from a Panther weapon. And that shot could have come through the door by a man who had just been shot in the heart. They would have us believe that even though there was only one Panther shot, they called for a ceasefire on three different occasions and didn't get it, and so they continued their firing. The great variance between the physical evidence and the testimony of the officers raises the question as to whether the officers are falsifying their accounts. Those officers fired 99 shots through the walls of an apartment where they knew people were sleeping. Murdered is defined in Illinois as follows. A person who kills an individual without lawful justification commits murder if in performing the acts which cause the death he knows that such acts create a strong probability of death or great bodily harm to that individual or another. The federal grand jury comes to its conclusions. Unquestionably the raid was not professionally planned or properly executed. And the result of the raid was two deaths, four injuries, and seven improper criminal charges. In spite of those conclusions, the report then goes on to say, the physical evidence and the discrepancies in the officer's accounts are insufficient to establish probable cause to charge the officers with a willful violation of the occupant's civil rights. I want you to know that I want you to think. If you ever think about me, and if you think about me, niggas, and if you ain't gonna do no revolutionary act, forget about me. I don't want, my, I don't want myself on your mind if you're not gonna work for the people. Like we always said, if you actually make a commitment at the age of 20, and you say, I don't want to make that commitment on the because for the simple reason that I'm too young to die, I want to live a little bit longer. What you did, you did already. You have to understand that people have to pay the price of peace. If you dare to struggle, you dare to win. If you dare not to struggle, then goddamn it, you don't deserve to win. Let me say peace to you if you're willing to fight for it. Let me say it in the spirit of liberation. I've been gone for a little while. At least my body's been gone. You ain't got to feel after me. At least my body's been gone for a little while. But I'm back now, and I believe that I'm back to stay. I believe that I'm going to do my job, and I believe that I was born not to die in a car wreck. I don't believe I'm going to die in a car wreck. I don't believe I'm going to die from slipping on a piece of ice. I don't believe I'm going to die because I got a bad heart. I don't believe I'm going to die because of lung cancer. I believe that I'm going to be able to die what I was in the, in the thing that I was born for. I believe that I'm going to be able to die high off the people. I believe that I will be able to die as a revolutionary in the international revolutionary proletarian struggle. And I hope that each one of you will be able to die in the international proletarian revolutionary struggle or even be able to live in it. And I think that struggle is going to come. Why don't you live for the people? Why don't you struggle for the people? Why don't you die for the people?